Happy August to each and every one of you that are joining us right now. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Mostly gentlemen. We've got Kylie in the room. Hey, Kylie. It's good to see you. I am, uh, I'm, I've been traveling throughout June and July, so I have missed seeing so many of your faces and uh, some of your faces not so much, obviously. Uh, I'm looking at you, Piggott. Uh, I know you're new to the group, but welcome anyway. We're, we got we to gotta point out the new guy. Um, we're excited because of this August. We've got a lot of great content that's coming through in these roundtables. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that in just a moment. Before we do, I just want to welcome each and every one of you. Um, I know my dad was planning on joining us here in a couple minutes, but I know that he also has a difficult time with jumping on sometimes. So he might be joining us in a minute or two. So instead of waiting around for him to open us up in a word of prayer, I would love for David Beatty to just go ahead and pray for us, ask the Lord to bless our time together. Um, <clears throat> Do bring up uh, uh, Tony's son, Logan. Um, I don't know if you saw recently, he's a friend of a lot of ours. If you don't know Tony, he's been part of the network for many years. Um, and his son, Logan's been battling cancer and uh, they got some uh, not, not great news this last week, kind of a setback. And so we just can need to continue to pray. So David, if you'd bring him before the Lord as well. Dear God, I thank you that you are a gracious, loving and caring father. And I thank you how you sustain me and sustain us every day. Now, Lord, uh, first, we ask forgiveness for not recognizing those blessings. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I'm thankful, Lord, that you are faithful to us and that you're merciful and gracious and you're loving God. Now, Lord, as um, these folks desire to serve you in ministry, they've given their heart and life to the people that um, our Christians, Lord, I pray that you'll sustain them. And I pray that the idea network and even this particular um, uh, gathering, Lord, will be a source of encouragement and of information that they can use to uh, continue to serve the communities that you established in which they lead. Uh, Lord, I think of particularly uh, Logan and uh, the whole situation, Lord, I know that we've been following this for, see, it's over a year now, and I just Pray for Logan, Lord, and the ups and downs, hills and valleys that the whole family are going through, uh, Lord, can be, can wear on the emotions and can um, sometimes cause distrust, Lord, or questioning God. I just pray, first off, that you just be with Logan with this news. Uh, Lord, help him to see you through it. Pray that he keep his um, cheerful demeanor, his optimistic spirit through this, Lord, knowing that you're still the God who reigns and you're still the God that's in control. Think of Tony as he supports his family, being that leader, not just for his home, but also for his church and the various pressures that I'm sure are on his shoulders. God, I just pray that you would strengthen him. I pray that he has good people that he can reach out to regularly that can support him. And God, I pray that just supernaturally, Lord, even today you give him a more abundant grace and you'd give him the perspective and the um the attitude lord that he needs at this particular moment and i pray lord that through that he can encourage his family he can be with logan and encourage him and lord we know that we live in a sin cursed world this isn't the way it's supposed to be and lord as we see young people and good people go through hard times lord i pray that it'll just Help us to fix our eyes on you in that coming kingdom. I pray, Lord, that it will help us to realize that we're just pilgrims in this world just passing through. Oh, Lord, I pray that this conversation here uh, today, Lord, will be, will be honoring and glorifying to you. Lord, I pray that friendships will be knit closer together. I pray that you'll give us something that we can use this week for it's in your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. And again, welcome to those who were able to join us during the prayer. I got a new coffee mug. I feel really proud of it. That's why I'm actually showing. And look on the back, actually. This is this is classic. So we don't have any Mandalorian or anything. We're talking, well, there's no, there's no Anakin here. There's no even thought of Jar Jar Binks. This is before things went bad. Um, classic cup. Um, I'm gonna throw it over to Kylie because Kylie has a few um, announcements about the future. And then I'm gonna be talking about what are we doing now to prepare for the fall? What are you planning to do? What are the five things that must happen now? It's August. 
August, uh, which means we really got to get our head in, in gear because we're going into harvest season. So we're going to be talking about the five things that every ministry leader should be doing in preparation for the fall. And we're really going to be focusing on the date of November 30th. What do I need to do to be where I want to be on November 30th? Okay, so that's what my talk is going to be in just a moment before we get to it. Kylie Dulo, our partner in crime. Thank you so much. Take over. Hi, everybody. Welcome back for another week. It, this feels like the olden days with just me and Josh running the show <laughs> here. Um, Jason, of course, is uh, still on his missions trip, and uh, but he's really prepared so much for all of you this week. And uh, with the email that went out on Friday and the resources, we shared a ton of resources from last week. If you guys didn't see Jason's post on that this week, check it out on the Facebook group. There was so, I think there was at least 12. I'm not sure if you posted them all, but we shared 12 resources in the round table last week, um, which were, was extremely helpful with Dennis and sharing his knowledge on the subject. So definitely check that out. Um, we are three weeks from Idea Night. If you can believe that it is coming up very quickly on August 23rd. Of course, it's free to all of you. You guys uh, get to join in um, as part of just being members. Uh, so it's part of our way of thanking you for supporting the network. You know, your membership is more than just what you get out of it. And uh, the roundtables, you are supporting the network to continue on to be able to do uh, the summits that influence and uh impact other ministries and help other pastors getting them resources and so your membership really is um much much bigger than even just tuesday uh you're really supporting the entire ministry here and so uh one way that we can thank you for that is giving you free tickets to idea night a small way in my opinion uh because you guys are really um doing a lot to support us um I am not going to steal the thunder for the August announcement. We we showed sneak peeks of it uh, in the last couple of weeks. I think Josh is going to talk more about it at the end here. Um, but we're so excited about the lineup for August. I do want to mention as far as the summit goes, because we really are just uh, almost a handful away of months, months away from the summit. Uh, we're going to be releasing the first uh, stage of um sessions soon for you guys to be able to see what are the sessions and you can even start kind of mapping out what uh sessions you're going to go to so we're really excited about the summit and uh the family aspect of that ministry is uh there's it can be polarizing in a way it can feel like you're being pulled in two directions with your family and your ministry two things that you are incredibly passionate about and two things that God has called you into leading, but how do we balance those two things so that um, we keep them in the priority that God gave us? And uh, Tony Evans is our keynote speaker, of course, for that. And he's speaking specifically on that topic and all of the keynotes that we have for the general sessions um, have families and are experienced in ministry with family and how to balance that out. And of course, the whole ministry family is welcome to come. Uh, of course, your kids, in, in that sense of the ministry family, but also in the sense of ministry family of your entire staff, um, including, you know, from the ground up, your facilities guy. We actually have a facility facilities guy speaking um, at the, at the uh, event, but also, you know, your children's uh, school, Christian school teachers and your admin assistants and all of that. And so it's a um, very holistic view of the ministry family. So Super excited about that. Super excited to show you guys the first stage of the sessions so you can get to um, thinking through uh, what uh, what you want to go to and praying about that. So I'm going to turn it back over to our president. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and get it started right into the notes today. Um, I am going to talk about what we have coming up here in the month. But I'm excited specifically about talking about this. I'm really into it right now, obviously, because this is the world I'm living. I'm just coming back from a, um, a time away, a sabbatical. And so these things are my world right now. These five that I'm about to talk with you about are what I'm living. In fact, later today, I've got a meeting with my executive pastor to talk about these things. All this week, I'm going to be doing 
these five steps. And so what better way to, um, what better conversation that we might have than to say, okay, where are we right now? And, and if you're like me, it's so easy to focus on what is right in front of you rather than peering beyond the immediacy of the moment, the, the thing that I've got to do today to get past tomorrow and the sermon I've got to write for Sunday and think just a few more weeks out, just a few more months out, where are we going uh, so that we can accomplish what we really want to accomplish? I, thinking in terms more than how, what will make me happy today and where, what will actually provide me what I need three months from now, six months from now. So we're talking about vision casting for the fall, five things that you should be doing right now. And instead of breaking out into round tables, which is one of the benefits of the summertime um, uh, community being as small as it is, we're going to end with a Q&A and discussion with all of us present. So any questions that you have throughout this presentation, write them down and bring them at the very end. The three questions that I have for you, I'm gonna prep you for them and you're gonna see them in the notes as I walk through. The three questions I have for you that I want you to be wrestling with is, who are the top five people that you need to schedule a one-to-one -one with? Who are the top five people that you need to schedule a one-to-one -one with in preparation for where you're going? Okay, so we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Number two, the second question we're going to get to is, what is the one thing you must accomplish before November 30th? What's the big goal? What's the big thing that you really need to be put, putting your focus into? What will make you most rewarded, happy, feeling of accomplishment? If you can see this thing done by November 30th, what will make you go, man, not everything got done, but it's December 1st, and I'm really glad that, all right, fill in the blank there. Number three, how are you preparing for guests? How are you preparing for guests? Okay, those are the big three questions we're going to get to at the end, but what are the five things that you should be doing right now, August 2nd, in preparation for the next, uh, the next four months of accomplishment? Well, number one, I would say first thing you must be doing is regather the flock. You've got to begin by regathering the flock. Well, I mean, it is what it is, right? He's the good shepherd and we, his under shepherds, are responsible for the flock. But during the summer, the sheep scatter, they, they run and, uh, and they do it for a variety of reasons. Obviously, some are taking time off, some are vacationing, some are just in the midst of the busyness of summer schedule. And so we all understand that summer slumps. And if you're new to the ministry, if you're a church planter, if you're new to pastoring, don't let the summer discourage you. Everybody is seeing low numbers. Everybody is seeing um, lower expect, and you must lower your expectations throughout the summer. Very seldom uh, do you see something skyrocket uh, throughout the summer. Uh, so the, ski the sheep are scattering. And so what should we be doing at the end of the summer? Well, we should be regathering the flock. We should be bringing everybody back into the fold. And that's not going to happen the first week of August. That's not going to happen the second week of August. There's going to be a slow trickle back in. Here's what I want to challenge you to do. Don't just allow it to happen. Intentionally make it better than if it would have happen naturally, right? You know, as well as I do, naturally, September is going to be a better month than August. What can you do to make sure it's 20% better than it would have been if you had done nothing? There are ebbs and flows in ministry. Just like there are waves that are coming in from the ocean onto the seashore, the waves will come. And if you're out there on a surfboard and you kind of just ride the wave, you'll move, be moving forward. But what can you do to actually ride the wave is to put some effort and momentum into that surfboard and swim along with that current and ride that wave as far as you can. That's what we're wanting you to do for the fall. And so we do this by regathering the flock first and foremost. Now, how, how do we do this? Practically, I'll give you a few thoughts. Number one, personally touch everyone. We may want to rephrase that in our day and age. Um, personally, reach out to everyone, one-on-one. -on -one. Right. And here's, here's one of the things that you've got going for you if you're a church plant or a smaller church. 
this becomes much more doable. Now, the larger your church, the larger your staff. And so with a larger staff, you can uh, interrupt everybody's schedules and make sure that everybody is touching, every, but everybody should receive a personal touch, a personal text message. I'm telling you, you got 150 people come to your church. The month of August for the first two weeks should be about a personal phone call to every single person. You say, that's a lot of time. No joke, it's a lot of time. It's going to be, I mean, literally, you need to look at August 11th and 12th and say, those days are done. I'm, I'm scheduling those two days. All I'm doing is phone calling people. Yes, yeah, a text is a lot easier. It's a lot faster. Of course, it's a lot easier. It's a lot faster. But a phone call where you leave a voicemail message because they're not going to pick up will show that you were the one who actually called that you were thinking about them. It also allows there to be a sense of uh, personal uh, connectiveness, right, to it, uh, because you're thinking about them. You're not just clipping and pasting a text message like I did this morning with many of you, uh, and then put the name at the top that changes, right, and it's the exact same text that everybody got. No, no, a phone call was going to indicate to them, okay, pastor is actually thinking about me right now. And, uh, and take that opportunity. Don't just think. Uh, thinking about somebody is not praying for somebody. You understand that, right? Uh, we, we say, hey, I prayed for you. And what that means is you came to mind this week. Thinking uh, turns to prayer when you actually engage with God and say, God, really help this person. And, and I know that they've been struggling with their, um, with their job. And I pray you give them the job that they need. So personally touch everybody. Uh, schedule a face-to-face -face with all top leaders. So if you have 150 people in your church, you honestly should schedule a few days where all you're doing, every single person you're personally connecting and saying, how are you doing? What's going on? What have you been up to? What's your summer been like? Hey, I've missed you a couple of weeks. I'm, I've, I'm just seeing you. I can't wait to see you. And that will just, just categorize it. Three days of your life gone. You'll never get it back. It is what it is. Okay. Uh, next, again, under rehab of the flock what you must do is schedule a face-to-face -face with all your top leaders. Have a face-to-face. -face. That's what I'm in the midst of right now. Right now, I'm going to begin with my EP uh, today. Um, I'm going to begin on the Idea Network side with a personal conversation with Kylie, personal conversation with, with Jeremy Rance. Um, this whole week, that's all I'm doing when it comes to my key leaders, one-on-one, face-to-face. -on -one, -face. Now, depending on your personality, it's going to, you're going to have a difficulty on one of these two things in this face to face meeting. You need to get personal and you need to give focus. Depending on how motivated you are going into the fall, you're going to struggle with one of these two. So, what I mean by that is this if you're really excited about what God's put on your heart for the fall, all you're going to want to do is sit down with them and be like, okay, let's talk about the fall. You've got to stop, stop, and uh, stop, and begin with how are you? What's going on in your life? How are your children? You know, last time we talked, you mentioned something about uh, your mother not doing well. How's your mother doing? The person who excels at this that I know, well, there's a bunch of people, but actually, Jeremy Rands is so, so very conscientious about caring for people. Beautiful thing. And somebody who leads a larger ministry, it's not always obvious to see this in somebody's life, but he genuinely does. And so I like to think about people who do well in these areas and try to mirror what they would do. Since I, by nature, am not a caring person, um, I want to think about caring people. So get personal. But then number two, get, get focus. Give focus, I should say. Give focus. You say what I mean by that? Um, it should not just be a personal conversation. If you're talking to your leaders, they're looking for focus. Where are we going now? What is the focus? What's the energy? What do we want to accomplish? And so I'm going to get to sharpen your focus in a minute, but you'll see why you need to get focused. We'll come back to that. So I this is where I want you to answer that question to yourself. Who are your top five people that you need to schedule a one-to-one -one with? And when is that going to happen? Well, that needs to happen before August 31st because you're talking about the fall. All right. So when I talk about regathering the flock, I'm talking about personally touching everybody, everybody, even the grandma that comes once a month, contact that person. Uh, then schedule a face-to-face -face with all your top leaders and then increase your social media presence and double the emails until the end of August. Increase your social media and double the emails till the end of August. So if you send out an email once a month, do it twice a month. If you send out an email once a week, do it twice a week. Figure out what those emails are. Maybe they're different. Maybe they're not just a formatted email. Maybe it's just a personal email. 
whatever it might be, double everything that you're doing, increase your social media and be pointing to the fall. Man, I'm so excited about school getting kicked off again. Boy, we're excited about back to school Sunday. Oh man, VBS was amazing, but I can't wait till you hear the guest preacher that we're having on August 28th or whatever it might be. Increase, increase. Let there be a sense from your church congregation, this whole first point of regather the flock. There needs to be a sense from the average church member, ooh, we're coming back. Everybody's coming back. Things are starting to ramp up. Just like the school district does, so do we. Number one, regather the flock. Five things that we need to be doing right now in preparation for the fall. Number one, regather the flock. Number two, sharpen your focus. You can't do everything. So what are the things you must do? Sharpen the focus. What is the one thing? This is the second question I want you to be wrestling with. What is that one thing that you must accomplish before November 30th? Sharpen the focus. You say, man, there's so many things we need to do. Okay, so write them down. All right, you wrote down 12 things you need to do. Knock off the least important six. Now you have six. Those are the six things you must do. All right. Now, if you were to have out of these six, knocked off three, you say, I can't. No, do it. Just knock off three. Okay. Now you have three things you've got to do. Now, as you look at those three, what's the number one thing if you get to November 30th, you will feel most accomplished if you did? It got the, the, what's the number one thing? For us, there's a bunch of things at Southern Hills we need to be doing. There's one thing that has risen to the top of focus that we have to focus on. For us, we're in a season of evangelism. We need first time guests. So our goal between August, I think 23rd to November 30th is 130, uh, 182 first time guests. That's our goal. Actually, August 28th to November 7th, 27th is what it is. Uh, there's 14 weeks there. Our goal is 182 first time guests. That's not a family of five. That's a, what that counts for one. A family of five counts for one first time guest. Uh, well, that's what we're looking for. So everything else is subservient to that. Nothing else matters. Except, I should say the thing that matters most is that. So I'm sharpening our focus. Now, as it relates to sharpening our focus, once we have that one thing, we, we ask the question, what two big events can I cancel in September and October? that will give us more time to focus on that number one thing. I don't know about you, I'm a throwaway guy. I like to throw things away. Um, I don't I like, I like getting a new shirt because one of the things that happen when I get a new shirt is I get to take that shirt into my closet and I get to throw away an old shirt. So I don't have what a lot of people have and that is um, a, a sensibility or a compassion or, or, or a nostalgia about, I like to throw stuff away. So if you're not like me in this, that's okay. You can, um, you can uh, I think, what would Josh do on this? Oh man, he'd be excited about canceling this event and canceling that. And can cancel is awesome. Canceling is fun. Throw it away. People will be upset when you throw it away. Sure, they'll be, throw, they'll be upset when you throw it away. But it'll allow you to have a little bit of focus and more time and energy so that you can accomplish the one big thing. So when we're talking about sharpening our focus, the third thought here is, so what is that one big thing needs to happen before November 30th? What are two or three or five or one big things that you can cancel so you can give you more time? And the third thought here is, where can you emphasize your focus in your upcoming sermons? So for me, as I'm looking at the sermons in August, and if you're like me, you preach through books of the Bible, we're in the book of Luke, right? But it, as I'm looking through the book of Luke, Luke chapters eight, chapter eight, over the next two months, I'll be teaching through. I'm thinking to myself, okay, where does evangelism naturally fall in these passages? What does the Bible teach us here? So this Sunday, for example, I'm preaching uh, Luke chapter eight, verses one through 15, and it's about uh, the sower going forth to sow. And it's not an evangelism passage. It really is not. It's a passage about being receptive to the word of God, to receive the word of God. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about you need to receive the word of God. You need to hear and receive the word of God for yourself. But the next passage, it, Jesus says, don't let your light be hid under a bushel or, or something. I don't know. It's, it's something like that. That's, a, that's an evangelism passage. 
I mean, that's so, that plays so well. So I'm able to strategically say, okay, where am I going? Well, what am I preaching in the future? And say, ooh, that, that whole sub point there. There's going to be, maybe the whole sermon is going to be about the focus of what our church is doing. And in that, I'm able to naturally and in a exegetical way, focus our church on the big focus of the fall. So regather the flock. This is what we should be doing in the beginning of August. Number two, sharpen the focus. This is what we should be doing throughout August leading into the fall. Number three, third thing you should be doing right now in preparation of the fall. Number three, prepare for guests. If you did nothing, you'll probably, if you have a location that is conducive to this, and if you have people that like your church, those are the two things, you'll probably get guests. That caveat is to our church planting friends in schools. They never happen to get guests. <laughs> they are always working for every single guest. So you're probably going to naturally receive guests. If you work at it, you're probably going to ride that wave and you're going to get more guests. So my question is, well, how are you preparing for guests? Evaluate uh, a few things you can do to prepare for guests. And these are, this has been written at ad nauseum by many, many people. So I'll just give you a few thoughts in your mind going to the fall. Number one, evaluate your insider terminology. I was away from Southern Hills for nine Sundays this summer. That's never happened for 18 years. I've never been away from our church for that long. Um, I think the most ever was three Sundays in a row. So this has been odd. But what gave me an opportunity is to go to nine different worship experiences, churches in the city and outside of the city. It was awesome. One of the things that was really interesting as I, is, as I was participating is just to be able to sit there and worship Jesus with my family and study the word. It's great. You know what it's like. But also I noticed how much insider terminology churches use. Like insider terminology, yes, denominationally, yeah. Uh, we were in, um, we were in Scotland. I went to a Presbyterian church. You know, you got to right Scotland. John Knox Presbyterian, mine as well. And uh, and it's amazing how much theological inside terminology that as a the study of the uh, as a theologian as a pastor, I'm like, I don't know, what does that, what does that mean? Uh, but I would go to a Baptist church or just an evangelical church, and it's amazing how much insider terminology as it relates to schedule calendar, events, things that are coming up. It's, there's this sense of, you, they don't mean to give it, but there's this sense of, if you're not part of us, you're not really part of us, which I get because of the way church is supposed to be. But man, those Sunday morning services, especially in the fall, we should be thinking through, I have guests in the room. Are they grasping what we're talking about? Um, practice uh, walking in as a guest. I'm going to be doing this for our church. And we're going to kind of do a little setup. What is it like whenever I walk into the foyer? What is it like whenever I sit down and hear the announcements? You may want to, in the month of August, if you have a friend coming into town, some of you might have somebody visiting, you may enlist a secret shopper. You don't have to have some kind of a, a grand plan for this. Give them a notepad and say, I want you to write down five things that we do well and five things we don't do well. And that'd be awesome. Now you're evaluating why you're taking that stuff. So you can think about it for your guests that are coming in the fall. Here's a third thought. Connection cards, connection cards, connection cards. Fellas, if you're not doing connection cards, I don't, I, I don't know what we're doing here. We've been talking about it for years. Get your connection cards in order. If you want to talk more about that, we can talk. Uh, but the connection card is the way to make sure that you're properly receiving the information. You cannot properly assimilate unless somebody gives you their information. You can't reach out to them. And so that leads us to the last thought here under prepare for guests, follow up with an effective assimilation system. We have much about assimilation systems. Um, we've, we've talked about it, like I said, you know, many, many times. Uh, if you want that information, reach out to us and we'll get it to you. Okay, or go to the podcast. There are a lot of episodes about that. Uh, okay, what are these five things we need to be doing right now? We need to wrap this sucker up. Obviously, Josh hasn't talked in front of a crowd for two months, and so you're just blowing it up. Okay, number four, number four, prioritize the family. I'm not adding this simply because, well, we got to add it. You know, you preach a sermon about uh, giving and you better add the gospel at the end. It's what you're supposed to do. I'm not adding this because you were supposed to add this. I'm adding this because the fall is an important time for your family. Um, so much is happening. A lot of your kids are in sports. They're younger. Um, and you're thinking to yourself, well, we got to have 182 guests. No, no, no. You've got to be at every game. 
You've got to be at every game. When is your family day? You can't cancel that. Get fanatical about your Sabbath. You're not going to be the man you need to be in 2025 if you're not taking the time for your family in 2022. So when is your Sabbath? What are you doing on those family days? Have you put thought into what you're going to do on those days? Or are you just going to be re-watching Breaking Bad on, on Netflix? Like, is that your plan for family day, right? What are you doing with your children during that time? And, and I, I, really, I really think the older I get, the more I realize how intentional you have to be going in. So it, it feels... And, and I'm going to say this quickly and then move on to my last point. It feels like the first three points have everything to do with your calling and ministry. And the fourth point is kind of like, well, and also take care of your family. Nothing could be further from the truth. The base and the core of your relationship with your family, every other ministry stems from that. If that is not in a healthy place, these other things genuinely won't matter and won't accomplish what you want them to accomplish. So prioritize family. Lastly here, schedule, last thought, five things that we must accomplish now before heading into the fall. Uh, number five, schedule your 2023 planning retreat. Last thing you should be doing right now is you cast vision for the fall is you should already know, okay, September 8th and 9th or October 12th and 13th, I'm going to be spending the time thinking through next year. Now, that can be as simple like when we were church planters, that could be as simple as um, you getting in the office by yourself for 48 hours and spending from 8 o'clock till 10, 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. just focused on the next year. You're not taking phone calls. Um, you're, not, uh, you're not taking meetings. You're not counseling. Uh, you put on your voicemail. If you contact me, I'm not going to be available right now. Whatever, whatever you've got to do. Or it could be as simple as somebody in the church has a cabin somewhere, and then you borrow their cabin for two days, and all you're going to do is focus on the next year. Uh, somebody you know has a place where you can get away. There are a lot of pastoral retreats. I go to Ironwood. If you've never been to Ironwood, they have a free shepherd's um, opportunity for all shepherds. You can go and you can do planning there. It's free the first time you go. And then they, um, they charge you a little bit um, the, the other times. When are you getting away to focus upon the coming year? Once you get away in the middle of September, October, you can focus on a few things. What are my top five goals for 2023? Where do I want to preach through? And what do I want to say? What is God leading me to in 2023? And really, those are the main things that I focus on whenever I get away for an annual calendar planning. What do I want to accomplish? From there flows your calendar. And what, do, what does the Lord want me to preach through? And from there flows your sermon schedule. And that'll keep you busy for two or three days. So vision casting for the fall. Here are the five things that we should be doing right now. Regather the flock, sharpen the focus, prepare for guests, prioritize the family, and schedule your 2023 planning retreat. So we're going to begin with Q&A, and I'm going to throw it back to you guys, and we're going to find out what questions you might have. And then we're going to go to those three questions, and I'm going to bring questions to you, those questions of uh, who are the top five people you need to be meeting with right now, what is the one thing you must accomplish before November 30th, and how are you preparing for guests? So let's go for Q&A. Who might begin with a question based upon what we've been talking about thus far? Go ahead and unmute yourself, raise your hand, whatever it might be. Okay, I will bring you questions if you're not bringing me any. All right, okay, let's go ahead and begin. Who wants to start with that first? Uh, that first, this is more of an accountability type of a conversation. Uh, who are the top five people that you need to schedule? And you get you say, wow, that you don't know who they are. I, that's not the point of this exercise. The point of this exercise is not for us to know who your beacon is or your secretary is. The point of this exercise is for you to verbalize these are the people I need to schedule with. For me, hey, those Josh, people. Yeah, go ahead. This is Tim. If if I can ask a question on Tim, uh, go. Um, so we talked about regathering the flock. Um, I try to do that each year. I guess what I feel guilty about in the fall, it seems like uh, the next year, it's like saying, 
hey, it's summertime. We know you're going to be gone and um, just wondering. And I've been doing pastoring for 30 years, uh, so I know it happens. I understand the ebb and flow. But uh, how do we keep from just saying, OK, I know um, you're going to go on vacation and deal with that without saying, hey, just sleep in all summer and I'll see you in the fall. So just any thoughts there? I'd love to hear your thoughts, Tim. I mean, you've been in the ministry for so many years. I'll give you mine, and then I'd love for you to share what yours are um, with the team. Um, I try to go out of my way to um, deal with the reality that people are gone and give permission, um, not to sleep in, but the reality is, uh, hey, you, we know a lot of you are going to be gone for the summer. Um, a lot of you got big travel plans coming up. I don't think acknowledging the reality of travel and family vacation and summertime schedule um, is a is condoning just not showing up to church or sleeping in because I, I don't think it, I don't think that that's the majority of what's going on in my local congregation now if it is something that you as the pastor feel like okay let's actually analyze this and 50 percent of our if, if we're down by 30 percent let's say and half of those people that we are down by, I genuinely believe, are just watch, watching online or sleeping in or whatever you're uncomfortable with. Then that's a, I think that's a sermon. And I think that's a conversation. So one-on-one -on -one conversation, then teaching, hey, this is inappropriate to do this. But, you know, what you should be doing is traveling through the summer. That, that's what I would say. So I kind of lean in. We even say during the summer, man, we've got so much stuff coming up for the summer, but a lot of us are going to miss it. And in fact, you're reminding me, Tim, we did that going in from May into June. I did several announcements where I'm like, man, I'm so excited about what's coming up this summer, but I'm going to be gone for some of so much of it, man. Some of you are going to be traveling. You're going to have to miss out too, but this is going to be an exciting summer for those who are going to be here. Um, and we emphasize that side of it. What are your thoughts, Tim? Uh, I agree. I, I think we've got to give people permission to take family vacations and to encourage it, make sure they're building those memories and, and stuff. Uh, so uh, what you said is is where I would be. I just kind of sometimes when I move toward the fall and we you know, back to church and those kind of days, <clears throat> thinking is it put in the mind of people, okay, it's okay to be slack. So um, yeah, I think we've got to be very grace oriented and, and encourage people to um, go out of town with their family, make sure they're you know having time away uh, without them feeling guilty. But um, yeah, I just, I, I'm sure there's some that, you know, just leave, are very passive about that and just kind of wanted to uh, get your thoughts there. No, I, I love that. Let's see if there's a follow-up question here from anybody, but I'll, I'll give, I, I get it, Tim. Like um, it drives me nuts that I have people literally tell me in the month of May, hey, pastor, I heard you're gone in June. Um, I, I won't be back till you get back. And that's their way of complimenting how great I am it just makes me so angry. And so it'll come out even in the preaching and I'll, and I'll say, but, but what I learned from some of my team members is that I can address the issue by going positive rather than negative. Meaning negative is some of you, you just leave in June because I'm not here, which means it means more about me than, than your faith is more about me than it is Jesus. I can also address it positively by saying, you know, some of you know that I'm not going to be here in the month of June and, and I haven't been here all summer, but you were faithful to come to church every single week, which means your faith is not about me. Your faith is about Jesus. So one addresses the bad person. The other addresses the good people. And it, and it, um, it uh, uh, what's the word, uh, celebrates what we want repeated. That's, that's something that I really struggle with, um, but I think it does play into this conversation a bit. Good. Thanks, Tim. Any other questions or thoughts based upon what Tim said or based upon the five things we must be doing now in preparation for the fall? Andrew. Yeah, I, I think you're right on it with it, Josh, talking about focusing on the positive as opposed to the negative, because for me, the summer slump, one, there's just fewer people um, and therefore fewer needy people, fewer problems, I guess, to deal with. And so the ones that actually are in town or aren't as busy over the summer, you're able to have a little bit more of that one-on-one, -on -one, that more relational time with them. And so I try to take advantage of that leading into the fall. Um, and it kind of gives you a leg up as you start thinking towards regathering the flock in August. And so, Tim, I really struggled with that. Uh, it's There's nothing more frustrating than people 
you know, their new Liberty is I'm, I'm gone now two or three weeks and everybody talks about needing that time off. And so they see that as their opportunity to almost look more spiritual. And there's absolutely a frustration to that. But for my own sanity, I had to try to flip it and look at the positive angle of, you know what, with the ones that are here, I get more opportunity in the four year with them, more opportunities to eat dinner with them throughout the week and look towards the positive angle as opposed to the negative, because it just, it just drives you insane. Good thoughts. All right. Who wants to, Oh, James, it looks like you unmuted yourself. What's up, James. Yeah. I got a question for you guys. Cause, um, so I am, I'm officially two days into being a lead pastor and the, this last Sunday was um, the pastor, the former pastor celebration Sunday. And so it was packed out. It was full. We had people in the hallways. So I'm preparing for this next Sunday where everybody's going to be gone. Right. Um, and it'd be my first Sunday in the pulpit. I guess my question is kind of, you know, stepping into this new role, um, November 30th, what would you guys say is the, the one thing or the two things that I need to do stepping into this role? Because I feel like there's 5 million things I need to do right now. I'll give my thoughts and then I'd love to hear from some of you guys um, on yours. The number one thing I would do between now and November 30th is have as many one-on-one -on -one conversations over food as possible. Coffee, dinners, lunch, and you're basically, the political world would call securing your base. The, the biblical language would be shepherding your flock. Um, you're just getting to know and spending time. Now, apparently you've been there a while, so you know them, but you know them now differently, right? This is, um, it's different than when you're dating your, your, your fiance than when you're actually married you're their pastor now, right? Is that right? Yeah, you're officially mm -hmm. their pastor, James. Yeah. yeah, and so I would say, hey, this is exciting. I just want to spend some time with you. And then once you're securing that base, that's what I would say. Rob, you've been in multiple ministries and you've served as a pastor for many years. What would you say James's primary focus in the month of, through the next three and a half months should be? Don't, all the things that you have to do as a pastor, but don't make changes <laughs> This is not the time to make changes. This is the time to secure your base. Having those lunches and dinners and things is of utmost importance. When, when you have settled into the role of pastor and you have gained the people's trust, that is the time to make changes. Right now is not the time. Now is the time to preach, to let them fall in love with you. You fall in love with them. Um, become their pastor. Um, and then, you know, God give me wisdom on when and how to make those changes. All the little things that a pastor has to do, give me wisdom on, on timing and um, how to use my time best, but fall in love with your church and just become their pastor. Um, but don't look to make changes. You know, man, the last pastor, and we all do it. We all do it. He should have done this. He should have, shouldn't have done that. We all do that. You know, when I'm pastor, this is how I'm going to do things. Um, and it, it is human nature. It is normal. But just give it time and take that time to just love your church. I love it. David Beatty, um, you went through this transition whenever uh, you became the senior pastor of your church. I'd love to hear. Um, I'd love to hear some thoughts from your perspective. I'll add quickly this, James, I tell our team that it's never wrong to look at a specific two months in ministry and change your schedule, personal schedule. What I mean by that is um, sometimes we get this idea, I better be at the office at eight o'clock and work till 430 and go home like somebody that's normal. But if during this time, your entire focus is about spending time with your people, you might say, hey, my day starts at 1230 when I meet that guy at Denny's. And I'm not done until nine o'clock. Well, why kill yourself from eight o'clock till 10 p.m. and kill your family and all this? Um, you can only do so much. If the best time you can invest is with your people, then reevaluate your schedule based upon when they're available and then sleep while they're doing whatever they're doing, because you're going to be with them four, five nights a week, and they're only going to be with you one night a week. So don't expect yourself to have the same schedule that they have or that other people have so that's that helps me that helps our teammates during a specific time of just intense pastoring uh david what are your thoughts 
Yeah, I would maybe just key off of what Rob said and say, just really double down on improving your Sunday morning preaching. Uh, I think we all, you know, are on some kind of spectrum of, of, of satisfaction with how we delivered, how we prepared and how it was responded to. Um, you're coming up to some really great holidays, some family oriented holidays, some feel good traditional, you know, Sundays. I would use the next, uh, you know, those months to really just shore up your preaching, your study schedule, uh, get into that rhythm because ultimately, um, you know, I hate to say it, but if, if, if our preaching uh, stinks on Sunday morning, it really impacts every other avenue, of, uh, every other place within the church. And I know for me, that was the hardest thing that I struggled with. So, you know, maybe just focus in on that and just use the holiday season to really uh, kind of tighten the church around, you know, your vision, your mission, what the Lord's showing you. I love that you use the word rhythm, David. I feel that um, consistency in sermons has everything to do with rhythm. So if you're going to be consistently good at what you're doing, establishing a rhythm of writing and preaching is essential. Stephen, Chevron, what's up, man? So um, I just wanted to ask you guys about, you know, I love number two here, sharpen my focus and get down to the things that I need to get down to. Uh, my, my question is really about how to best um, get other people's focus show, uh, sharpened too. You know, as far as I, I know meeting with them and sharing with them and even congregationally sharing things like that. But, you know, I, I've been here for almost two years in the Midwest, different culture than what I grew up in, um, all this different things. Great church guys have been doing a lot of things. But as far as getting people on board with what I feel that Lord really wants us to do and the direction he wants us to go, that's really been the part that's um, lagging behind, at least in my mind. I could be way off, but at least for me, that's the part that's lagging behind. So I guess this is all about, you know, what is, what is your focus? What are your goals? This is how you can trim the fat and really be focused and ready. And I'm asking, all right, well, how do I get that to everybody else? You know, um, past those meetings and, and what happens, what happens when your church is like, nah, how hard do you push? You know, you don't, you don't want to like, you and your wife be like throwing around the, the D word all the time, you know, like, well, if you don't do this, I'm out of here. You know, I don't want to be like that because I love these people. Uh, but how do we get going? You know, how do you get the train moving? I guess. You know what I'm yeah, I'll, I'll take that. And then anybody else wants to jump in. Um, Steven, do you remember, do you remember when David was with his, um, his people and, um, and suddenly they went away to fight with the Philistines, if you remember, and they came back and their entire village was burned, right? Um, and now David's in a place where he has to get these people to follow him. And they had just taken their wives and children and burned their houses. I mean, this is a bad, bad moment. And you, you remember, because we've all heard the sermons and we've preached it. What did David do? Do you remember? Yeah, he had encouraged himself in the Lord. Right, right. Okay, so so it's it's something that we heard in youth camp, <laughs> um, and we've heard a thousand times before. But really, I think the the only way in which David was going to encourage, meaning take courage and put it inside of his people to follow him to the next destination rather than getting killed, um, was to then go find encouragement with the Lord. You cannot fake enthusiasm long enough to have people follow you indefinitely. Mm -hmm. You have to genuinely be enthusiastic about what's next. And so if and when you spend time with the Lord and you're encouraged, like, yeah, I can be encouraged and excited about this. I can be encouraged and excited about that. And you may not be able to be encouraged and excited about everything. That helps define your focus. But whatever it is that you can be encouraged and excited about, that's what you're able to bring in and infuse them as they reflect back to you, enthusiasm and excitement. People will do this at different levels based upon region. Yes, based upon personality, uh, they will reflect back. You can't expect their level of excitement to rise beyond your level of excitement. But if you can um, encourage yourself in the Lord and then bring that encouragement and 
and, and infusing of courage for the future to them. I've, I've seen that that's been helpful, but it begins there. Anybody else have practical thoughts as it relates to St Stephen's question they'd like to share? What do you do whenever you, you're looking at people and you're like, man, I'm ready to go for the future. I know where we're going. I'm, I'm ready to get lean and mean and make it happen. But it's like pulling teeth to get these people to follow you. I think just like Josh, you said, shoring up the base when you start a new church, one thing you have to do is just shore up your ability to deliver. So find small things that you can deliver on quickly to show that you're not just a visionary, but that you can actually implement the things that the Lord's laid on your heart. Uh, when you do that, that gives them the assurance that, you know, you're not, your head is not always in the clouds, that you're also thinking practically of how to, how to execute. And I think that builds a lot of trust and it builds momentum because I don't know about you, you all, but there have been many times where I've been super excited about something and then it just became a lower priority on my plate and it dissipated, disappeared. And that's not a really good, you know, you don't want to have that kind of track record. So I think just shoring up some of the small tasks, quick wins, demonstrating what that win means to the church and the overall mission, and then kind of building up to that, you know, grand vision and how we're going to get there. That is really good. This fall for some might just be, okay, I need to find three, two or three small wins that we can really hit hard in November 30th, by November 30th, so that I can use those and, uh, and bring it to the people next year and say, hey, you remember the lion and the bear? Remember how we killed those back in the fall? Man, this next year. And then it goes to those one-on-one -on -one conversations. I think bringing that, those key individuals in and saying, hey, do you remember how we killed that lion and that bear? That was awesome, huh? You remember that guy that got baptized and that family that got saved? Remember that guy's testimony about getting off drugs? That was awesome, huh? We're going to do more of that. And I want you to be supportive of me. Um, and those one-on-one -on -one conversations have been helpful. By the way, I just really looking people in the eye um, has really helped in those one-on-one -on -one conversations and looking at a guy and saying, hey, I'm really excited about this. I need you to be excited about this as well because what we're doing, I can't do by myself. Saying that to four or five guys suddenly just gets 150 people excited because they're up, up front. They're saying amen. They're, they're, they're behind you. They're having those private conversations. Oh yeah, I believe in pastor where we're going. Great thoughts, David. Somebody else, anybody else want to speak into what Stephen's saying? Philip? Yeah, one of the things that I've I've had to realize is if um, if if I know where God has put on my heart for us to go, and I've endeavored to cast that vision or whatever, and people just don't seem to get excited about it or get on board, chances are I haven't communicated it clearly. I haven't communicated in a way that they're catching it, and so I need to evaluate how I'm presenting it, how I'm casting that vision. And, and maybe even through some of those private conversations, be able to, uh, to clarify it with them and, and even they can help me clarify it uh, with, with the congregation. So uh, many times that's, that's my challenge. I am often uh, very, I'm often, as my dad would say, clear as mud, you know, so. <laughs> that is good. Very good. Very good. Somebody else? I would say, uh, Stephen, make up in your mind that no matter what, you'll stay positive about how you address and how you feel anything. Um, I've, there's such a tendency among some pastors to, to just kind of revert to, oh, of course y'all not doing this. And then that negativity goes back into you. Uh, I, was, I was at a church where somebody sang a special one time and as they were coming down, people weren't clapping the way the pastor thought. And his first words out of his mouth were, what is wrong with you all and <laughs> that's not that's not the thing to say in a church worship service but it just meant that he gravitates towards negatively handling everything instead of just stay positive because your positivity will win out and somebody will you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna jump on but if you get negative you could kill it to yourself um so stay positive you can no think those what. thoughts right you just can't say them yeah yeah, I think those thoughts, I, I think I've told you the story about the church planter. He told me that the, he was just so discouraged on the way to church one Sunday and they were in a rented facility and he had been working like a dog to get it going. And on the way to church, he drove by two other churches with full parking lots, good churches, gospel preaching churches. And he was just like, God, why am I here? This is ridiculous. Um, my sermon is not good. And he showed up. The piano player wasn't there. Uh, the music had to be played on a track tape. 
Um, and then he got up afterward and his wife is back in the back pressing play on the thing. And he gets up and he says, I'm really thankful you guys came today. Honestly, if I wasn't the pastor, I wouldn't even come to this church. <laughs> he said it. He said the quiet part out loud. What we all have thought. I mean, you've, I've thought that so many times over the last 18 years. I thought I would not go to this church. This church is stupid. But you're not allowed to say that to the people. And he said it out loud. And his wife was back and she's like, don't, don't do it. So yeah, thoughts come in. <laughs> but not every thought should go through the mouth. Uh, but yeah, positive. Rob, you were going to say something? By the way, I'm sorry, uh, Rob, I told your story. I'm just <laughs> which is great. <laughs> uh, exactly what was just said is exactly what I was going to say, is you cannot let people dictate your encouragement in the Lord. David did not allow the people to dictate his encouragement. Um, you know, we're going to kill you. Um, and I'm sure that there's times that you might feel like, man, they want to kill me. They want me out. But if it's God that has led you there. God is going to give you the wisdom to move forward. And if they're not getting on board, just be patient. And culture does matter. Culture does matter. So it, learn the culture. And the culture of the church is a slow moving culture. You can slowly change that, but it's going to take time. But don't let them discourage you. Keep encouraging the Lord. Keep moving forward. But I don't know who was just speaking, but man, that was brilliant stuff. That was very good. Awesome. Any last thoughts? Any last questions before we uh, wrap up today? Oh, you know what? I'm supposed to. Um, I'm supposed to preview. So uh, let me preview where we're going over the next few. Um, uh, over the next few weeks, we are excited because next Tuesday we've got Kurt Skelly with us. Uh, he's going to be sharing with us about the future. Gary Chapman. Uh, for those of you who know Gary Chapman, who wrote Five Love Languages. Uh, he's going to be with us two weeks from now. Uh, three weeks from now, Tom Rayner is going to be with us. And then Mark Miller in the last of August. So we've got five uh, sessions, four of which are going to be awesome. And you already walked through today, so you'll be fine. Uh, it's a great month. We're excited about it. Be at whichever one you feel is going to be most helpful to you. And, uh, and we look forward to that. Guys, thank you so much. Again, I've said this um, via text, but man, we appreciate your uh, support of the network. Uh, we want these roundtables to be genuinely helpful to you and to your ministry. But in reality, we know that one of the main reasons why you are part of the membership is because of your desire to support the network and, uh, and see it accomplish what it's been accomplishing over the last few years, helping ministry leaders connect uh, for health, friendship, and fresh ideas. And we continue to look to that vision uh, in the future. Uh, we appreciate each and every one of you. If you need me for anything personally, don't hesitate to reach out. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys.